Chapter 14 I stayed in my closet until the noon whistle began to blow at the Snapfinger Volunteer Fire Department. Of course, Peach had wailed to high heaven when I'd slammed the back door. The sound of his boohooing followed me up the stairs and all the way to my closet. No one called for me. No one came looking for me. And I hadn't done one thing but lie on my cabbage roses carpet and breathe in and out for almost three hours, clutching one of great-great-aunt Florentine's pillows. Maybe I even fell asleep once or twice. The closet was a good place for listening, almost as good as listening rock. I could hear life going on at Snowburgers while I stayed in my closet. Tidings trimmed the hedge out front. He sang from the halls of Montezuma while he worked. He was a terrible singer. I heard the creaking of the tin roof heating under the sun. The telephone rang a hundred times downstairs, and I heard my mother's voice talking to folks all over the countryside. I smelled good smells coming from the upstairs kitchen. On funeral days, Mama and Daddy were always so busy. But you've got to eat, great-great-aunt Florentine would say. Otherwise you'll expire, great-uncle Edisto. Always cooked his famous cornbread and good black snap beans and corn on the cob if it was summer. Great-great-aunt Florentine fried chicken in the deep cast-iron skillet and made sweet iced tea. Sweet tea is an art not easily mastered by the faint of heart, she'd say. I feel the same about cornbread, Great Uncle Edisto would reply. On a funeral day, we ate dinner as the noon whistle blew. We'd sit down together and hold hands around the table, and Daddy would say, for example, Let us be thankful for the life that was Elaine Hindman, and we'd all squeeze hands. Then he'd say, Let us be thankful for one another. We'd squeeze hands again, then we'd eat. Then we'd go to Elaine Hindman's funeral, all of us. I got off school for more funerals than I could shake a stick at, but I always made up my work. The noon whistle finished its one minute blowing. You never realized how long one minute could be until you heard that whistle go on and on. It was long enough to wash your hands and get to the table on time. I skipped hand washing, and instead I pulled on my lime green shorts and my snowburgers baseball shirt. I scrunched my toes into my flip-flops. There was no missing dinner on a funeral day. It just wasn't done. I'd have to see Peach, not to mention Mama, who, I knew, must be so disappointed in me for yelling at Peach twice in one morning. I wondered if I could suddenly get sick. Deathly sick if I concentrated. No. I wasn't good at sickness. I was good at death, though. Possibly I could sink right into the floor of my closet. A disappearing death. No. I would have to show up and take my chances. Aunt Goldie stood at the eight-burner stove in stockinged feet and wearing terry cloth slippers with a bibbed apron over her funeral dress. She was using a rubber spatula to scoop mashed potatoes out of a pot the tidings held upside down over a bowl. Her hair was piled on top of her head and twisted like a cone of butterscotch custard at the dairy dip. Mama was settling settling Mary in her high chair, and Mary spotted me first. Fumfort, she squeaked. She clapped her small hands. Heads turned. Peach wouldn't look at me. I wouldn't look at Mama. Aunt Goldie gave the spatula to tidings, wiped her hands on a dish towel, smiled at me, and said, Come here and let me kiss you, Puddin. Her bracelets clinked as she opened her arms wide and gathered me to her. How did I miss seeing you last night? She gave me a wet, perfumed kiss. We need all the extra kisses we can get today, she said. Sit, sit, sit. Daddy, already sit-sit-sitting at the table, pulled out my chair, and I slumped into it, relieved that Aunt Goldie didn't want to throttle me. Or maybe she did. Dismay was under the table. I slipped off my flip-flops and slid a bare foot over his black coat. He licked me on the leg. Tidings put the potatoes on the table, arched an eyebrow at me, and sat between Peach and Mama on the other side of the table. Mama busied herself with Mary. When she and Aunt Goldie were seated, Daddy put out a hand to me on his left, not Aunt Goldie on his right. Mary was already squeezing two of my fingers tight in her tiny fist. I closed my eyes like I always did. Let us give thanks for the life that was, Daddy's voice choked, Florentine Snowburger. I squeezed Daddy's hand extra hard. He squeezed mine back. Peach sniffed twice and cried a short hiccuping cry. Dismay thumped his tail from under the table. The grandfather clock ticked time away in the upstairs hallway. Daddy took a breath. 
Let us all give thanks for one another, he said. I squeezed. Daddy didn't let go, so we all kept holding hands. Soon I opened one eye. Aunt Goldie's blue eye was looking back across the centerpiece of Zinnia's. I opened both eyes and looked at Daddy. A long tear snaked down his cheek. Aunt Goldie said, And let us love one another. Daddy still held hands. Aunt Goldie said, And let us eat this magnificent dinner that Goldie Sugars has made. Glory, hallelujah, I declare she has knocked herself out. Out, said Mary. Eat. Yes, said Daddy, letting go of my hand and opening his eyes. Eat. He kissed Aunt Goldie's fingers and let them go. Thank you, sister. It looks delicious. I had never seen Daddy cry, not even when Great Uncle Adisto died. It made me want to cry for Daddy's sadness, for my sadness, for the sadness of everything. I couldn't stand it. I'm sorry, I blurted. I kept my gaze on the centerpiece of Zinnia's. Sorry, said Mary. She kissed my arm. Mama stopped helping Mary's plate with butter beans. Helping Mary's plate with butter beans, yeah. Tiding stopped sinking his teeth into a chicken leg. The air felt charged with the expectation of what might come next. Once I had started, I couldn't stop. Sadness leaked out all over the place. I'm, I'm having a hard day, I said. My tears dripped onto the great great aunt Florentine white lace tablecloth. I wondered what Peach thought watching me cry, but I couldn't help it. I felt Peach-like, but I had decorum. I didn't puddle into a heap and wail. Daddy put one hand on the back of my neck and handed me his napkin with the other. I blew my nose. Aunt Goldie got up and poured me a glass of sweet tea from Aunt Florentine's etched glass pitcher. I drank it all down at once. You need to eat something, dear heart, said Aunt Goldie. Tidings, butter this girl a biscuit. She poured me more tea and said, When Peach doesn't eat, his blood sugar plummets, and we have to pick him up off the floor and put him to bed for hours. I'm surprised you're still upright, Comfort. I nodded. Tidings passed me a biscuit, and because Aunt Goldie would stare at me until I did, I took a bite. Then I looked at Mama, who gave her head the tiniest nod of approval. It was all I needed. I swallowed and said to Peach, I've got a bottle cap collection. I can show it to you after dinner if you want. Great Uncle Adisto had willed me his bottle cap collection, and Peach knew it. The world's most amazing and thoughtfully collected collection of bottle caps in the South. Uncle Edisto had said. I was proud of it and took good care of it. Peach looked at Aunt Goldie. He had been studying her every word, every move. She threw her hands to her throat and said, Oh, you don't mean to tell me! Which made Tidings laugh. A bottle cap collection, she said, as I live and breathe. Peach brightened. Am I invited to your room to see it? I could feel my face flush red, and I stared at the biscuit in my hand. Yes, "'Glory, hallelujah,' said Peach. "'I'm coming to see you, Comfort.' He had a toothy grin on his face and an expectant look. I gave him a halfway smile back. "'Eat,' said Mary, banging her spoon on her plate. "'Yes,' said Mama. "'Eat, Comfort. "'Everything will be all right. "'We'll all help each other today.' She blew Daddy a kiss. The sun slipped behind a curtain of clouds, and it began to rain.